Uh, so we're first going to talk about the importance of maritime technology. Um, what is it used for? How is it connected to those other themes? Um, and uh, why is it so important for this particular time period, um, our global middle ages? Now, as you guys know, our AP World History class is um, starting in a new timeline this year. It's AP World History Modern. And um, so we're actually going to start a little bit before 1200. So our new class, um, AP World History Modern, starts at 1200 CE. Um, but I'm actually going to start us a little bit before that and understand some pre-modern maritime technology. Just because 1200 is such an arbitrary time date, especially for um, oceanic trade, particularly in the Indian Ocean, just doesn't start in 1200. And so knowing where we're uh, coming from and knowing where we're going, understanding that timeline and the complexity of that timeline with maritime technology. And then our big focus for this time period 1200 to 1450 is on the Indian Ocean. And um, that is with the deliberate exclusion of talking about the Atlantic and the transatlantic maritime voyages. That's going to be something that's super, super important, but not for our time period that we're starting with. Once we hit unit three, when we get into like 1450s to 1750s, our global focus is really going to shift to the Atlantic world. Um, with the voyages starting with Columbus and um, the consequent um, empire building that's going to happen between 1450 and 1750. So that really isn't a huge topic though for 1200 to 1450. We're not there yet. So our focus is really on maritime exploration that's going on in the Indian Ocean and across the Pacific mostly. And then, like I promised, we're going to do some practice questions. So you guys stick around to the end. We're going to have multiple choice practice questions. We're also going to have a big short answer question. And so I'm so happy that you guys are here joining with me. We're going to jump in and talk about some content. Now, if you are ready, let's go. Why do we care? <laughs> Why do we care about maritime technology? Why is it so important? And um, what are the connections that it has to other areas? Well, first and foremost, when we're talking about maritime technology, we have to connect it to trade. Because when we're talking about, especially um, up till 1450, the driving factor uh, behind maritime voyages was trade. How do we get what we need um, to survive? How do we get the things that we want if we're not growing those in our area? Well, we need to get them by trade. And most of the trade was going on in the Indian Ocean region. And in the Indian Ocean, it was quite diverse because the Indian Ocean connects East Asia, connects the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, with those trade routes going all the way to East Asia to China. And so trade was really the driving force behind creating new and better technologies. Well, when we have a growth in demand of trade, as merchants, we have to meet that demand. I mean, it's true for any trade. If there is a demand for it, producers are going to want to meet that demand because it means that they're going to make more money. So if we have a growing demand for a good, as a merchant, we need to get that good. We need to access it quicker. Not only do we need to access it quicker, we need to protect our investments. Now, let's say that you have a ship and you are going to sail it across the Indian Ocean and you're going to get a ton of resources from one area and bring it home to India. You want to make sure that your investment is protected because you're buying all of those things at one trading port, putting it on your ship, and you have to make sure that you can get your ship safely back to India with your goods on it so that you can make maximum profit. And so we want to protect our investments and protecting our investment means we need better and safer technologies that can get us where we need to go quicker and safer and with all of our goods on board. And so trade is really a driving force behind the technologies. Another driving force behind technologies is going to be state building. This is going to be important, particularly as a connection into 1450 to 1750, um, because empire building, we want to make sure that we can get access 
to our areas under our domain. If we are building up a trading post empire and we have trading posts on the coast of Africa, we have trading posts in Southeast Asia, we need to get to those areas and protect those areas as best as we can. Another important thing, particularly in our time period 1200 to 1450, isn't so much empire building, but the building of port cities and as city states. And that these areas um, are going to be really autonomous and independent of each other. And they are going to want to expand their trading influence, expand their taxation influence, and they want to pull merchants into their trading port more than a trading port nearby. They want to make sure that merchants are coming to them, that it's going to help continue to build up their city and put money into the pockets of those people that live in that area. And so you want to lure trade in a sense. And um, ways they do that, sometimes it's by religion. A lot of times it's by infrastructure, having safe port cities and inns, uh, places for these people to go that are coming from all over the world. You want to kind of draw them in. And by drawing them in, you need to have a good, safe city or a good, safe state where they're going to want to come and stay sometimes for months on end during those trade seasons. Another important connection is with culture. And um, because one thing that we're going to notice throughout all of trade, throughout all of history, is that trade doesn't just kind of exist in a bubble. We're not just bringing goods with us from one area to another. Merchants also bring with them their religions. They bring with them their um, ideologies. They bring with them their languages. And so as we're having this spread of people, we're also spreading communication. We're starting to understand um, the importance of connections between areas. And during this time period, 1200 to 1450, we kind of have a golden age of learning, particularly in the Islamic world. And these uh, developments in mathematics, the developments in astronomy are going to influence and better um, lead to even better technologies for maritime navigational purposes or shipbuilding or map making. And the, what's going on in our cultures and the influence on learning is going to have a direct impact on the types of technologies that we have and how good of technologies that we develop. And a lot of these things, what's really important is that they are going to spread from one area to another. And that's important just for any type of technology. We're going to see the spread of technologies from the center of origin, and we're going to see those diffuse to other areas. A lot of times it's like a direct diffusion. We trade directly with a place, and we're going to take the technologies that they're developing, and we're going to use them. Sometimes we're going to improve upon them. And so something that could be a very um, simple, almost basic maritime technology can be used later in history in a different region, that same basic technology, but just improved upon. And that's also important while we're starting pre-1200 for this live review, it's because a lot of these basic maritime navigational technologies and shipbuilding and sails are going to be almost the same, just improved upon those basic designs by other societies. And that's true for really all technologies. I mean, even when you get to that um, lesson that we're gonna have later in the week on the Silk Roads, other technologies that are going to be developed spreading across, you know, from East to West. And so understanding the connection that maritime technology has to trade, to politics, to culture, and to other societies that they're connecting to is why maritime technology is so important. Now, it's not just the technology itself, it's also the people that develop it and how they develop it for the purposes that they develop it. All right, side note, remember all of those things that I'm saying about the importance of maritime technology. It may come up later in the live review. Wink, I'm trying to give you guys a little hint, wink about those practice questions that we're gonna see at the end. Now that we've kind of went over these basic importance to maritime technology, now we're gonna kind of connect it to the actual technologies 
and we're going to connect it more to the time periods. So like I said, when we first started, we we're going to kind of do this in two ways. We're going to do pre-1200 um, maritime technologies, and then we're going to do 1200 to 1450, which is our Middle Ages, kind of our early modern period that we're starting AP World History Modern class in. So we are actually going to start in that kind of period zero. Any of you guys, teachers um, in here or students, let me know in comments. Are you guys, um, where are you guys at in history? What are you guys studying right now? Are you still on kind of pre-1200? Are you into 1200, 1450s? Are you already at unit four? Let me know in comments where you guys are at in your classes. All right, pre-1200 maritime developments. A little bit about pre-1200. This, um, a lot of teachers are calling um, period zero or unit zero um, because this was the information that was kind of cut out from the new AP World History Modern. And so if your classes did not start with a unit zero or a period zero pre-1200, some of these things may just be um, background for you guys. Um, again, this stuff won't be actually on the test, but we can always use it for contextualization. Another important piece is continuity and change. And um, maybe your teachers um, have been using those phrases before continuity and change over time. When we talk about continuities, we're talking about things that stay the same throughout a huge time period. So when we talk about these developments that are before 1200, how are they connecting to 1200 to 1450? And you're going to see the ship designs, you're going to see the sail designs, and you're going to see the navigational tools and when we get to 14, uh, 1200 to 1450, you're going to see the similarities with those. All right, so, yep, starting 1200, 1450 time period. Exchange, that's perfect. We're right in there right now. All right, so when we're talking about pre-1200 maritime developments, I want to go back to the really the most prolific long distance maritime tradition, and that's actually with the Austronesians. Austronesia, we're really talking about this area of the Pacific that includes Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Polynesia, Micronesia. The earliest long distance sailors came from this region of Austronesia, and mostly from Polynesia and Micronesia. And that's really our most prolific, our biggest, most important long distance maritime um, connections because the Austronesians, they sailed thousands and thousands of miles across the Pacific. There's even evidence of them reaching um, the west coast of South America. And they did this with very, you're going to see in here in just a few moments, very primitive technologies. Um, but this maritime tradition is very rich and the same kind of basic um, ships and basic um, maritime tools are going to be used and developed by other cultures as well. In the ancient world, um, we're going to see maritime traditions um, in Egypt. We're going to see them developed in the Pacific Ocean, or sorry, in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean with the Minoans and the Phoenicians and the predecessors of the Greeks. Uh, we're also going to see them in the Indian Ocean as well. Again, this is pre-1200, so we're going to do kind of Indian Ocean uh, before 1200 and then a huge focus on the Indian Ocean 1200 to 1450, as well as everybody's favorite, the Vikings, the Norsemen. And um, all of these maritime traditions are going to connect peoples um, to other locations in the world. And again, a lot of the drive for this was trade. What's really interesting about um, the Austronesians is the driver really wasn't for trade. It was for um, more areas to settle, for new um, islands to settle and develop and grow foods and um, really more permanent settlements. Whereas Egyptians, they're more about connecting their state. Um, we're going to see it with the Minoans and the Phoenicians really driving trade in the Mediterranean. 
Indian Ocean pre-1200 is really going to be more about that northern part of the Indian Ocean into like the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea um, into South Asia. And then, of course, the Vikings, the Norsemen, um, which are going to um, be for trade as well as for um, it, really short term ransacking and um, taking, uh, which is, of course, what the Vikings are most known for. But they were also prolific at setting up trading ports and connecting all around the world. All right. So we're going to go into all of these a little bit more in depth for each of these. And we're going to talk about some of these technologies specifically. So again, with the Austronesians, we're connecting a huge area. The largest area at this time period is going to be connected by the Austronesians. Um, Polynesian sailors are going to go from um, the areas of the far South Atlantic all the way across um, sorry, far South Pacific, all the way across the Pacific. And there's even evidence of them connecting to the West Coast of South America. And when we say there's evidence of it, well, some of the ship designs and um, some of the foods um, like sweet potatoes may have come all the way from this area of uh, Polynesia, even some words. And that's kind of how historians, archaeologists get that evidence of these connections. But what's really, really cool about the um, Austronesians and especially the Polynesian sailors is how they got so far with these really kind of simplistic technologies. How many of you guys have seen the movie Moana? Sign off in comments if you have seen the Disney movie Moana. I love Moana. It's one of my favorite Disney movies. Love it. If you know from Moana, it actually, it's not super historical, but of course, like every Disney movie, you know, there's some pieces of history that are, you know, right. And some that are, you know, wrong. Oh, I wish I could remember that song. If you've seen the movie, help me remember the song. I always get goosebumps when I hear it. She goes into the cave and she bangs on the drum and, and kind of this vision appears about their wayfinding traditions. Is it called We Know the Way? Is that the name? Help me out in comments. What's that song? Anyways, it kind of goes through the history of wayfinding. And they actually, you can see, they hold um, the guy singing, he holds up his hand up to the stars. I think it's called We Know the Way. And that is actually how they found where they were um, on the open seas. I call it celestial navigation, celestial because it refers to the stars. What's really important about if you're on the open sea is knowing where you are in relation to the stars because the stars actually have pretty um, similar positions in the sky just depending on the seasons and you can navigate where you are based on the horizon to the location of the stars in the sky. And you can actually do it with your hand. And so they would essentially create like a, like a geometric um, way to figure out based on your location along the horizon and the angle to your hand, to your fingers, where these stars were to help you figure out kind of a basic um, where you are in relation and what direction that you're going. And that's really, really important if you are trying to figure out where you're going is knowing which direction. And if you've gone off course, how to recorrect and go and turn and go into a different direction. Now, this is really cool because they're just using their hand. It's, um, it's a technology, technically, because they are using science or using astronomy in the study of the stars. They're using geometry. Um, and it's a very basic way that they're using technology as a navigational tool. Remember this, because as we go later into 1200, even all the way to 1450, even to the 1750s, we're still using really basic celestial navigation, even though the technology gets improved. And even though the uh, geometry and the science gets improved behind it, it's still just basic celestial navigation, finding where you are in relation to the horizon line and in relation to the stars in the sky. And it's all, you know, starting very basic from the Austronesians. If you haven't seen Moana, 
go look up that clip. I'm pretty sure the song is called We Know the Way. And I love that part of the whole movie, one of my favorites. I also linked, um, make sure that you guys look on the slides. I have the slides here at the bottom um, of our screen. You can kind of see them on there. I actually have a link on here to a TED Ed video um, on wayfinding, which I think is a really cool, it's like an animated video. I love TED Ed videos. I'm gonna make sure you check that out too later. Not now, because I'm teaching you stuff right now. And then let's talk about their um, sailing technologies, how they got from these areas. We know they use navigation, celestial navigation, but the um, ships that they used are called outrigger canoes. Now I have a picture of like a reconstructed outrigger canoe. This kind of basic design is still used in a lot of areas in Polynesia and Micronesia. Of course, now we have much bigger ships that are much safer, um, but the design of these outrigger canoes um, are actually pretty ingenious because what they would do is they would create like a counterbalance. You can see that there's a really long ship where the people would be, and then you can see that there's this kind of counterweight outrigger where it kind of looks like a sidecar. If you were to have like a motorcycle sidecar, that's always what these outrigger canoes remind me of. And what they would do is they would help kind of give a counterweight and a counterbalance so that they could cut across really large ocean waves. Because what's really important to remember is these Austronesians are going thousands of miles, hundreds and thousands of miles across open seas. And one important thing to know when you're losing that side of the land on this open sea is that you could face huge ocean swells, huge um, waves. And to cut through those is really important. These outrigger canoes actually are pretty lightweight. And so you could rebalance yourself and you could reposition where you are. They kind of turn on a dime in a sense um, based on the shape of these um, sails and the shape of the design of the canoe itself. And they're actually very easy to navigate and to manage on those open seas. All right, so those are the Austronesians. Again, make sure you check back in the slides later at that cool video. And then of course, watch Moana. I shouldn't be plugging Disney, should I? Anyways, I love that movie. Let's go on and let's talk about the Egyptians. When we think about the Egyptians, a lot of people don't think, wow, Egyptians are prolific sailors. Um, but Egyptians actually did create um, interesting uh, maritime traditions because we have to remember the Egyptians were really um, focused on the Nile River. The Nile was so important to their empire building. And again, I said about uh, the connection to state building and um, connecting lower Nile and upper Nile, lower Egypt and upper Egypt and having that um, really strong um, trading tradition up and down the Nile River connects the empire and keeps it unified. And so the Egyptians were um, prolific sailors connecting up and down the Nile. Not only that, the Egyptians also connected into the Mediterranean as well as into the uh, Red Sea. And um, one interesting thing to note is that the Egyptians did trade across the Indian Ocean as well. We have um, evidence of connecting to the um, Harappa civilization of South Asia along the Indus River Valley. And how would they do that? They have to do that by sailing. So the Egyptians um, did create and improve upon some early um, sails and technologies in this area of the Mediterranean, South Asia. So let's talk about the loose footed sail. We're going to see throughout the other technologies we're going to talk about is um, about sails and their design. Really kind of two basic ones up until 1450. We're going to see square sails and then we're also going to see triangular sails. And these two sails really have kind of different purposes. When we're looking at like a square sail, it's more going to just propel us in the direction in which the winds are going. And so when we have these technologies with the uh, wind just kind of taking us along, this loose footed sail can be maneuvered um, along with the winds to kind of go in one direction or the other. But as we're gonna see later with these triangular sails, they're going to not have to rely so much 
on the direction of the wind. But early on, these Egyptian kind of square sails are really just going to be propelled with that wind. Another cool thing that I want to point out in that kind of looks like a diagram where it says loose footed square sails is that you can see um, the row rowers. I can't say that word. The oarsmen. We'll say the oarsmen because I can't say rowers. You can see the oarsmen. And in this diagram, you can see that they're using and relying quite a bit on these oars. And um, it helps kind of propel and get you where you're going using manpower. You can also see in this diagram, I think it's kind of fun, where you can see the guys up by the sail because you can move and um, change the sail so that it's going in that direction of the wind, taking it where you want to go. Now, the um, really, really, we have an early tradition in Egypt of these um, square um, square sails and these loose footed square um, square sails. But one thing that's really cool that the Egyptians um, were the first to create were these stern mounted rudders. So with the stern mounted rudders, what you would actually do is um, so the stern is in the back of the ship. Hopefully I did that right. Stern is on the back of the ship. And what you would do is you would use this as kind of like a directional aid. And so you would have the steering oars on the sides, but then you would use the rudder that's going to be kind of to till and to steer you in the direction that you want to go. And the first evidence that we have of the stern mounted rudder comes from the Egyptians. So it was mostly for kind of navigation and putting you in the direction that you wanted to go. And so we're going to see other um, mounted rudders and later even today if you ever go on a fishing boat of course you're going to see and um, the rudders it's going to kind of tell you in one direction or the other to get you into the direction you want to go <clears throat> so that is the egyptians let's talk about the mediterranean kind of our early history of the mediterranean we have the minoans and the phoenicians the Minoans and the Phoenicians were prolific in the Mediterranean and developing really kind of like a trading empire of sorts in the Mediterranean. And these technologies that they develop are going to be improved upon by the Greeks later. And so um, early on, the Phoenicians created a, a bireme, which is kind of like a two-decker I'm um, ship. <laughs> if you've ever been like a double decker bus, <clears throat> you can kind of think of it like a double decker ship. By means two. So what they would do is they created two banks of rowers. I um, mean, so it's in, kind of increasing that manpower, kind of like an early naval ship. It really was like a warship. And then the Greeks are actually going to improve upon that earlier technology of the Phoenicians and create a trireme, which is three banks of rowers. And these Greek triremes are really like warships because they had tons and tons of men on board. And what they would do is they would, um, it would allow them to cut across the Mediterranean very quickly um, and develop kind of like a military style presence in the Mediterranean. And again, we talked about the connection to state building, having that protected trade and um, kind of a military influence um, also propels the state in that area. And so what's really cool about this trium is kind of like the most common ship of the ancient Mediterranean world. Others are going to use these and develop and improve upon kind of this basic design. You can see here in the picture that this Greek trireme also has this kind of square footed sail. And again, we're going to see later the triangular sails. Um, but here in the Mediterranean region, Egypt, we're really seeing a lot of these square sails. Another interesting one that people don't usually consider a maritime technology is a lighthouse. Any of you guys sound off in comments, ever seen a lighthouse up close? I know you probably have seen them. We have somebody in Massachusetts, Washington State, bet you see a lot of lighthouses. I'm originally from Nebraska. And so my first lighthouse that I ever saw was when I was on vacation in Massachusetts. And I was like, this is a real lighthouse. So this is what it's for. But actually the first ever 
that we know of, Lighthouse, came from the port of Alexandria, um, which was built by the Greeks and not the Egyptians at this point, because remember um, Alexander the Great um, conquering across the Mediterranean world and North Africa, uh, developing the port city of Alexandria, the um, what historians know as the earliest lighthouse, it's known as the Pharos of Alexandria, and it was a lighthouse. And lighthouses, what they do is they help um, sailors um, so that they don't crash into the um, land, so that they know uh, where that port is, um, especially at night. And so um, what the lighthouse, the Pharos of Alexandria had was during the daytime, it had a mirror on it at the top. And then you can see this guy in this picture here, um, it's actually a mosaic, and um, it would angle the mirror to the sunlight so that it would reflect and act kind of as a beacon for those sailors so that they know where the port is and where the um, land is. And at night, they would actually light a fire um, at the top of the lighthouse, again, giving those sailors in the Mediterranean an idea of where the landfall is and where the port city was. And fortunately, the forest of Alexandria no longer exists, womp, womp, um, but it is the earliest known example of a lighthouse. And again, these technologies are just simply improved upon. I mean, the modern lighthouses that we still use are the same basic design. Now, of course, we have real electricity for lights, um, but the same basic design is there. And then everybody's favorite, the Vikings. Now the Viking technologies are going to be in Northern Europe. The Vikings or the Norsemen kind of come from this area of Scandinavia. And the Vikings, what everybody knows about them is like the pillaging and the stealing and the ransacking. What a lot of people don't know about the Vikings is that they really set up tons and tons of cities around the world. Um, Dublin, Ireland, I always, um, was one that a lot of people don't know about. Dublin, Ireland was a Viking port city. And so developing these port cities really developed kind of an early Northern European, European trading empire of the Vikings. And they went um, evidence to North America, to the Mediterranean, and the Viking technologies and their shipbuilding allowed them to do this. And you can see the design of these ships does look pretty similar to other designs that we've had. Now, the Viking longship is what most people know about the design of the Vikings. And the, the longship, there actually really wasn't kind of one standard design of these longships. They took a lot of different forms. Um, but what a lot of these longships uh, most notably had were double ends. And so what's really cool about these long ships is because they were double ended, you could reverse direction really quickly without having to turn around. So you don't have to worry about turning these ships. What you would actually do is just focus your oarsmen the other direction and the front becomes the back. And so this would be really, really helpful, um, especially in northern latitudes, having to reverse course really quickly um, because there's a lot of storms that happen in the North Atlantic. And of course, as the Titanic discovered, um, you could hit a, a um, glacier, a glacier, what's the word, an iceberg um, in the North Atlantic as well. And so being able to reverse direction is also very, very helpful. And then one thing that the Vikings used were sundials. And so we talked about celestial navigation earlier. What do you do during the day? And so the Vikings developed a sundial or is sometimes known as a sun compass, which um, is kind of like celestial navigation during the day. But instead of relating it to the stars in the night sky, you're relating it to the sun's position using the sun's shadow, which is pretty cool. What this did was I'm figuring out along the horizon line compared to the sun's shadow, um, what direction north is. And so kind of acting like a compass, you can know where the direction of north is, and then you can relate your directions and where you're going based on that northerly um, direction. All right, so that's about pre-1200. Let's get into the nitty gritty and let's talk about 1200 to 1450. So 1200 to 1450, most of our trade is going to be along the Indian Ocean because it's connecting 
tons of regions between East Africa, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, all the way to China. And so this is very, very diverse when it comes to trade. It's diverse in the goods that are being connected across the Indian Ocean. It's diverse in the peoples. It's diverse in the um, merchants that are um, trading and connecting these areas. It's diverse in religion. It's diverse in the governments that are operating in these areas. But one thing that's really cool about the Indian Ocean trade is that it was largely devoid of huge empires that controlled it. And that's going to be something different once we get 1450, 1750. It's going to be really dominated by large scale empires. But Indian Ocean trade was really pretty autonomous and pretty independent of each other. And one thing that's really important was the mastery of the monsoon currents. We didn't really talk about this with a technology base, um, but understanding the swells um, of the monsoons and um, helping to cr really create like monsoon seasons, which created trading seasons. What these merchants would do is they would go in one direction, the way the wind would carry during one season, stay there. And then when the um, monsoon winds reversed course, you would take it back into that direction that we, which you came from. So it created almost like a trading season. So we'd have trading season open, merchants would come in and flood into the cities, and the seasons would change, and then the merchants would go the other direction. And so we had these technologies that are really improving upon um, earlier technologies, but also were specific to the area because of these monsoon currents and because of the wind currents that would take you um, in one direction or the other. And because of the increase of demand for trade, we would need to have larger ships that become more like cargo ships because if we're only going during that one trade season, we want as merchants to get as much stuff onto our ships and back safely and as best we can because we want to have the most goods that we can so we can make the most profit. And because you are taking so much inventory back with you, you want to make sure you have good navigation and safe navigation and safe ships that you're going to be able to carry all of your goods back. Now, a lot of this Indian Ocean um, trade before 1450 is really going to be dominated by Muslim and Hindu sailors, really kind of the high time of Indian Hindu sailors um, early um, through the 1200s, um, pre-1200s, uh, definitely, and then Muslim sailors. And um, once we see the growth of the Islamic caliphates and um, into the Med um, into across the Mediterranean, North Africa, into the Middle East. And we're going to see a lot of influx of Muslim sailors into these areas as well. This is going to dramatically change post-1450 with the arrival of Portuguese sailors. As you're going to get to when we hit um, our next period, Unit um, 3, once you get to that, you're going to understand how these Europeans are going to navigate around Africa and make their way into the Indian Ocean, throwing off this kind of autonomous balance of power that we had in the Indian Ocean pre-1450. So let's talk about this Indian Ocean maritime technology. Talk about um, celestial navigation before with the Polynesians, how they used wayfinding, kind of using their hand based on the horizon line um, and the stars in the sky. And in the Indian Ocean, really early on in the Indian Ocean, this is pre-1200, they used what was called a Kamal. Um, for celestial navigation. And it's kind of like one step up from using your hand um, to tell you where you are along the horizon line. What it was was actually a wooden rectangular, um, like a card with a string that you could use um, as a navigational tool for celestial navigation. What the string does is it's giving you that um, geometrical angle that you can figure it out with without using your hand a little bit more reliable and then what's really important a difference that we're going to see from like the mediterranean and even the norsemen we're going to see in the indian ocean a different um, shape of sail with the latin sail and a latin sail is different because it is a triangle shape 
What these Latin sails did was they were able to kind of cut across the wind and they uh, could move very, very quickly um, using those monsoon winds. And this ship that you can see in this picture here is a Dow ship, um, which is going to be kind of a basic uh, ship uh, style for the, Medi uh, for the Indian Ocean that we're going to see there. Now, as time goes on in the same region, those kinds of basic celestial navigational tools like the Kamal are going to be improved upon. And that's what I said was important with this time period is we're gonna see them kind of amped up and improved upon. So rather than using the Kamal wooden you know, rectangle with a string, we're going to start to see the use of the astrolabe in the Indian Ocean. Astrolabes were probably first developed by the Greeks and then improved upon during this um, kind of Islamic golden age of learning. And this Islamic golden age of learning at universities, we're going to have a huge um, influence in mathematics, astronomy, and using those technologies for maritime navigation um, improves upon this astrolabe. So rather than using your hand or using the string, you're actually using a tool, kind of looks like a compass, but it does the same thing. What it what it does is it creates that kind of um, relative angle um, to the stars from the horizon line. Again, very basic skill that we were using in by the Polynesians with wayfinding with your hand is just improved upon and um, more um, accurately. And they're going to use these um, in the Indian Ocean and then continue to be improved upon. And the same kind of basic astrolabe technology will be used through the really the 1750s also. And then what I put here is cartography, not really a technology, but really, really important to this. I'm. Um, uh, finding your way and charting where you've been uh, for um, others to follow in the same direction, creating maps. That's what cartography is. It's map making. And one of the most um, known of this time period in the Islamic world was the ta uh, tabula Rogi oh gosh, Rogeriana. And this is um, called literally like the map of Roger. And um, because what this is, is a really pretty pretty accurate map of the Islamic world through, and um, you can see the Mediterranean, and uh, you can see the Arabian Peninsula. And what this um, did was it helped um, really kind of spur um, technology and um, the knowledge of what else is out there. And so cartography is going to be really important for posterity, for others to follow in that same suit to know what else is out there for history as well. And then, of course, the Chinese technologies. And the Chinese technologies, one, of course, um, that is super important is the magnetic compass, uh, which somebody put in our, got one vote for it, uh, for the poll. So make sure you answer in our poll. Using the magnetic compass, um, the magnetic compass was developed by the early Qin dynasty. Um, and then it was used in maritime navigation during the Song Dynasty. And so this magnetic compass, again, we're seeing that kind of spread of technologies from one area to another. Um, this magnetic compass would give a um, more accurate um, directional angle so that you would know um, not based on the sun or the stars, but kind of based on the Earth's magnet and um, what direction um, you're going. And these early magnetic compasses were um, south pointing. Later, we're going to see the north pointing magnetic compasses. The other thing that I have on these two slides are the ship designs. And so this early, you can see the junk ships. Um, they are using um, kind of a basic um, ship design. These look very similar to the Dow's. Um, in their ship design that we saw in the Indian Ocean. And then you can see the treasure ships. This is a model of the tre treasure ship that was used by Zheng Ha um, in the Ming Dynasty, um, who is going to um, be the most important um, sailor for the Chinese in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so this treasure ship, it's huge. It's like a warship. And um, what they're going to do is really create this kind of early worship design um, to create connections 
for possible links of trade in the Ming Dynasty, but I don't want to give you a huge spoiler alert. It never really came to pass. And when the Ming Emperor sent Zhang Ha home. All right. That's what we got for technology. Now what we've been waiting for, we have review questions. Woot, which I know is really, really important. Connecting these technologies to questions that you're gonna see on the AP test. So let's get into it. Got a few multiple choice questions and they're gonna do one short answer. So here we go, y'all, you ready? Here is our first practice question. This is a multiple choice question, so in comments, um, guess if your answer is going to be A, B, C, or D. So here we have an image. You can't really tell where it is or where it's from, but here it says, what advantage does the design of the boats shown provide? So looking at this boat, based on what we've learned today, what advantage does the design of the boats shown provide? Is it A, extra speed due to the aerodynamic design? B, room for additional cargo, C, space for many oarsmen, or D, stability while sailing through ocean, large ocean waves. Answer in comments. <clears throat> All right, got some guesses. The answer for this one is D. Good work, guys. D, this is, you can see an outrigger canoe. You can see this kind of counterbalance um, that you would be used to help um, for stability through those large ocean waves. Good job, guys. All right, practice question number two. This map is a little bit blurry, but actually, as long as you can see the basics, it's not really about the map. <laughs> So this question asks, from this map and knowledge of the Viking Age, which statement below is the most plausible reason for Viking expeditions? Plausible is like likely. So the most likely reason for Viking expeditions. Is it A, a desire to explore and trade with others motivated the Vikings to seek out new lands? B, technological advances in navigation and shipbuilding enabled Vikings to venture down rivers and far beyond the safety of the coast. C, due to harsh conditions and overcrowding in Norway and Sweden, creating colonies elsewhere was the primary concern of Viking exploration. Or D, the main purpose of Viking expedition was to steal goods and acquire slaves to work as thralls. So in comments, answer for number two, if this is A, B, C, or D. All right, number two, this one I think is a little bit harder than number one. The answer for number two is B, B, technological advances in navigation and shipbuilding enabled Vikings to venture down rivers and far beyond the safety of the coast. All right, next one, number three. This one, we have a excerpt, so I'll read it for you guys. Nature, this is from the Pomerant, this is from Pomerantz and Topic, the, wor the world that trade created. So this is a secondary source. Uh, excerpt says, nature also shaped the rhythms of trade and the places where it was conducted by constraining transportation all across maritime Asia from Canton to Mocha. Um, trading, sorry, Mecca, trading schedules were dictated by the monsoon winds. Since strong winds blew con consistently in one direction for several months and then stopped, and then blew consistently in the other direction for months, it made no sense to fight those winds. A trader went as far as he or occasionally she could in one direction and then stayed around until the wind reversed. His goods were then picked up by another merchant who had arrived earlier and knew precisely how long into the next season he could safely stay and still have enough days of favorable wind to get home. Thus, instead of Chinese traders spending two or more monsoon seasons and years sailing all the way to, say, Persia with silks, it made more sense to sail out one monsoon season and exchange with intermediaries based in between and thereby return home with frankincense and rugs. A series of emporia or trade centers developed at sites such as Malacca, Surat, and the Muscat. The only option. Siri, that I was talking to her. 
uh, that had more to do with how far one could travel from there in one sailing season than with what goods could be produced locally. The result was a remarkably lively and cosmopolitan chain of port cities along the Asian littoral uh, but in many cases, the cities had only weak relationships with their immediate hinterlands. So number three, who that was long. Why would the port cities above be perfect locations for cultural diffusions? So based on this excerpt, why would the port cities uh, be perfect locations for cultural diffusion? Is it A, their coastal locations gave them more a more hospitable climate? B, foreign merchants and sailors stayed regularly for extended time? C, each city already had a diverse population? Or D, they were disconnected from their hinterlands? All right, got some guesses here. The answer for number three is B, because when we're talking about cultural diffusion, when we're talking about religions, we're talking about language, we're talking about ideologies. So the answer for number three is B. Good job, guys. All right, one more multiple choice question. This is number four. <clears throat> so here we have a map. You can see um, we have a bunch of arrows. Um, hopefully you guys can read this one at home. So you can see these areas, these cities, um, and you can see the arrows, it has the kind of the animated arrows are the direction of the monsoon winds. And then these other arrows actually are telling us um, the um, types of merchants and sailors. So you can see coming from like India to East Africa, it says Arab and Indian traders into um, in Indonesia there into China. You can see it says Indian and Chinese sailors, Indonesian sailors, and then coming across we know this must be post 1450 because here we have the Portuguese merchants coming in um, from that Cape of Good Hope in Southern Africa. So practice question number four, which of the following statements could be supported by the evidence found in this map? A, powerful monsoon winds prevented Indian sailors from reaching East Africa. B, Indonesian sailors dominated the Indian Ocean trade. C, trade contributed to the growth of coastal cities with shipping ports or D, cotton textiles from India were heavily in demand around the Indian Ocean Basin. Again, answer in comments, friends. Nailed it. The answer for number four is C. You guys are killing it, you guys who are answering in comments. Good work on you. Now, last thing we're going to do is a <gasps> short answer question. You ready? <clears throat> now, let's kind of throw out some examples for A, B, and C. We're not going to expect huge answers here. Um, you can go back and write these out later for some real in-depth practice. But right now, it's just a quick live review. We're just going to um, throw out some examples and comments. So for A, this question is really about the impact of maritime technologies. So when we're looking at short answer questions, we wanna always kinda of wanna break it down of what we're actually writing about. So A says identify and explain one economic impact of the development of maritime technologies, 1200 to 1450. Now we haven't really done a lot of content in this one, so hopefully you watch the Indian Ocean one or you're gonna tune in later this week for more on um, content. So A, if we don't have some good answers, let's kind of throw out some ideas of what we could use. <clears throat> so an economic impact of the development of maritime technologies. What it's really asking is how did technologies help improve or change the economy? So we're talking about trade. We're talking about trade goods. And um, maybe you could say how it brought more diverse um, goods to economies in the Indian Ocean and um, based on the knowledge of the monsoon winds. Ooh. Maybe you could talk about the growth of port cities and um, that could tax um, uh, and improve the economies of those areas. You could talk about the um, types of merchants that were connecting and growing the economies of these diverse areas. So we're really trying to connect technology to economy or to trade. 
B asks, identify and explain one social impact of the development of maritime technologies. We can kind of use that excerpt that we just had previously. You can talk about cultural diffusion. Uh, you can talk about religions. Sometimes these port cities would use um, religion or convert to a religion um, developing mosques or churches um, <clears throat> or Hindu temples that could drive merchants of a particular religion to that area and entice them to stay um, since they know merchants could be there for um, seasons. <clears throat> And then um, C, identify and explain one political impact of the development of maritime technologies. Here we're talking about governments. Uh, you can talk about um, state building. You can talk about um, the Vikings creating kind of like a mini empire um, with other Viking um, outposts uh, across Northern Europe. You can talk about China and their desire to, um, under the Ming Dynasty, try to create connections for trade in the Indian Ocean. You can talk about the growth of city-states um, and population growth into those. And so not a lot of specifics here, but hopefully you guys can tune in to those other live reviews that we have going on at Fiveable and practice writing out and trying to answer all those parts in full sentences later. All right, that's all I got for y'all. Thank you guys so much for joining in. Remember that technology is not just technology, it also connects to other themes. Uh, one of the themes in our new AP World History Modern course is technology and innovation. So understanding these technologies as a specific theme, but then making sure that we're connecting it to other themes. We're connecting it to the peoples that are developing them and to the um, governments in those areas, and then the cultural impact of those as well. And then think about them over time. How did they spread from one area to another? How were these basic um, ship or sail designs or navigational tools developed over time and changed and improved upon by other societies? I'm so thankful that you guys joined with me today. Hopefully you guys can go to bed after this, especially if you're still tuning in from the East Coast and it's past your bedtime. Um, but I hope you guys have a great night. And thank you guys so much for joining me. And as Maui said in Moana, you're welcome. Have a good day, guys. We'll see you later here at Fiveable. Make sure that you are following us on all of our platforms at Think Fiveable. You can follow me on Twitter. I am Mrs. Leeson. I'm so happy that you joined with me today. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.